the most interesting guests in the music industry, entertainment, art, and politics, step into the studio for Turning Point with Frank McKay. Charlie Daniels is this week's guest on Turning Point with Frank McKay. Charlie talks with Frank about his steadfast connectedness to his southern roots, how he always stays true to his fans, and how he prefers music to the music business. Let's listen. And now, Turning Point with Frank McKay. Welcome to Turning Point. Our very special guest today is the legendary Charlie Daniels. Charlie, welcome. Thank you very much. Good to be with you, partner. Uh, wh where are you living nowadays? I'm in Tennessee. I've been in Tennessee now since 1967. I moved here. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, of course, it's, it's handy for me because it's an area where there's an awful lot of music business going on. And it's, it's centrally located. If I start out somewhere, I'm not so far from the population centers of the country. I get to spend more time at home by living in this location. You never got bit by the Hollywood bug. Oh, no. Good gosh. Or any big city, for that matter. I'm a... I'm a country boy. I like it. I live out in the country here, so I, I like it out. In the, I say out in the woods. We actually patch of woods on each side of my house. So I'm pretty happy with it that way. Are you a hunter? Well, I used to be when I was uh, when I had time to do it. I don't. I would probably now, if I had time. Uh, hunting's pretty time consuming, and sometimes you don't have. I don't really have time to get out and do it. But I do quite a bit of shooting, it's especially target shooting. But uh, I like my guns, yeah, definitely. Yeah. I, let me talk music for a little bit, and maybe uh, we can go way back into your childhood. I'd love to hear your, your earliest influences in music, and I'm sure our listeners would as well. Well, my earlier influences when I first came up, you know, when I came along, I'll be 76. Uh, you know, I'm 76 years old, and, and I was born in 1936. So uh, back during that time, the radio stations, there were not near as many of them as there is now. And they their mandate was they had to please everybody. They had to do something for everybody. So they would play all kinds of music. The stations were not formatted for one kind of music. They were formatted for, you know, they would play stuff in the mornings, the country music in the mornings. They would play things for uh, ladies who stayed at home, uh, you know, things that would, would suit them at that uh, like during the morning hours. About the time the kids came home from school, they would play whatever the pop music of the day happened to be. It was at one time big bands. Of course, it was constantly in flux and changing. But uh, I was exposed to a lot of different kinds of music. Now, my earlier influences, what I listened to more than anything else was country music. That was my favorite. We used to listen to the Grand Ole Opry uh, and, and uh, the country music shows that would come on. But I, actually, my influences go a lot further than that. Uh, the the big band days, see Tommy and Jimmy Dorsey and Harry James and those people, and you know the gospel music. Of course, if you're raised in the South, you're exposed to gospel music and uh, blues. Blues is a big influence, and uh, you know, and in anybody who's raised in the South is is exposed to blues. So my inf my earliest influences, though, when I first started playing, I uh, started doing country music, but my earliest influences are all over the board. Uh, Charlie, you were talking about your early, early influences. Uh, how about people-wise? Uh, your parents, uh, were they a big influence on your musical uh, career? Definitely. I was raised in a Christian family, a, a very loving family. We were very affectionate people. I was always, uh, in, well, in my early life, we moved away from the family uh, Pretty, when I was in the first grade, but during my very early years, yeah, I was raised around my grandparents, and, um, and both sets of my grandparents were still alive, and uh, I was raised in a very loving family, so I was very definitely influenced by my family. And you, you know, you grew up in a, uh, a tumultuous time. Uh, that's uh, that's for sure. You, uh, uh, you said you've been living there since uh, since 1967. Uh, I'm sure you saw a, a lot of things, and and you're certainly not the big city type, but uh, staying close to your roots there, uh, did you feel any of that? You know, the I, I hate to call it the hippie influence, but the uh, you know the the summer of love. You know, you mentioned 1967. Well, I think everybody was affected to one degree, and especially people in the music business, because music was very definitely changing at that time. It was kind of an exciting time uh, in music because it was a, you know, a lot of different kinds. Of music was being accepted. Uh, stations were actually playing anything from bluegrass to jazz. 
So it was definitely a time of uh, exciting time, a time that, uh, you know, when you felt you could kind of experiment, and that's basically the time when I started uh, playing music. I mean, you know, actually recording, seriously recording, making albums and that sort of thing was during that time. And definitely it was, uh, you know, that particular time, not so much the the hippie thing. I never considered myself to be a hippie, but uh, it was... It, it was a time that, that the music was affected, and that's what affected that part of it affected me definitely. Uh, what about uh, the the rise in the business? Uh, did you do you like the business in general? Did you like the climb? I love the business insofar as my part of it with with the, actually performing. Performing is my favorite thing. I enjoy creating music. I enjoy recording. And I enjoy every aspect but my ba- what keeps me in what keeps me going is performing that's my big deal that's what i like to do uh insofar as the business end of the music is concerned i try to stay out of it because i'm not very good at it i have very little interest in in being involved in music in the business part of, of the music business so to answer your question, I'm not basically, you know, I'm, I am not a business type person, and and I just don't enjoy that aspect of it. So, I try to steer clear of as much as I can. How many shows a year do you like performing at this point in your life? We do. Uh, we'll probably do ninety, oh, ninety something this year. Any anywhere around hundred uh, to you know. Um, um, 110 or maybe yeah. a few less than 100 but somewhere in that neighborhood that's usually about what we do but you add 10 grand Ole opry appearances to that and then a few other things the odds and ends that kind of go along with the territory uh it makes for a pretty busy year what was your busiest year as far as shows you know i don't even know because i was not keeping up with them then but it it was probably somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, 200 and maybe 225, 250, something like that, I imagine. I'm just guessing. I could have been more than that. And what happens to you, uh, like vocally even, singing that many times a year? I mean, did you did you run into any problems? I have from, in fact, as I talk to you now, you can hear a little hoarseness in my voice probably because it, it does happen. Uh I did, uh, when I go do dates a lot of times when it's very dusty outside, especially in the summertime when things get dusty and uh, there's a lot of dust in the air that seems to affect my voice to some extent, or I just have periods sometimes that my voice will will get, uh, I'll I'll have uh, periods of having some hoarseness, some periodic hoarseness, but basically my voice is pretty strong. And when you use it a lot, I think it strengthens, and you stay, you know, it really, comparatively speaking, no, there's not a lot of trouble. Let's talk about what led to your first record deal. Your fr- and, and again, the business has changed so much, and when we talk about a record deal, we talk about your first recording contract. Well, the first recording contract I ever had was a very short live thing, and I did with uh, Capitol Records. I did one record with them. Uh, then I moved uh, from there to the Kama Sutra record label, where I did uh, Neil Bogart, uh, where I did, uh, I did, I think, let's see, I think I did four or five albums for them. Mm. And then I moved to uh, the Epic label, to Ronald Luxemburg signed me to Epic Records, and that's when things, you know, we, we had some success before then, but we, to have somebody that really be- Ron really believed in in what I did and and what we were about, and he really wanted to sign the band, and that went a long way with me toward signing with the Epic label. It made uh, things really got to pop in then. I mean, when if you get something going and you can get a record company the size of 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 well, it was, at the time it was CBS, now it's of course it's Sony, but uh, that's it, it just raises you to another whole level. Uh, it just kind of puts everything on steroids when you get to the point where you can, you, you know, if you if you get something happening and that, because it's an immediate thing, they're able to get it. 
everywhere at the same time. They're able to, to get it on the radio at the same time to get records out to the record stores at the same time. I mean, it's just a, it's a whole nother, a whole nother situation. So we really, things really got to popping for us with, uh, though, as I said, we had some success with uh, Kama Sutra. Things got really got to popping for us when we went with, with, uh, with Epic. Turning Point with Frank McKay returns right after this. Welcome back to Turning Point with Frank McKay. You mentioned Ron Alexenberg. He's someone you, you and I both know and uh, both have a great deal of respect for him. What, what was it about Ron? Well, what is it about Ron? He's still going strong. Uh, what is it about him that, uh, that attracts bands to him, or is it the other way around? The first time I ever met Ron, uh, I didn't know any of the guys at CBS. We had had a very successful record called Fire on the Mountain at uh, Kama Sutra, and mm. we had let it be known that we wanted to we, we wanted to go to a bigger record label. We wanted to to change labels, and we had let it be known. And we had several record companies who were interested in us. We had uh, we we talked to a lot of record companies during that time, but the time that I met Ron was they came. Uh, Ron and a whole bunch of record executives from one at the time with CBS came to Houston, Texas, to see a show, to catch a show that we were doing, and to you know to make their offer for to, to sign us. And uh, I, I didn't know anybody in the room. I walked in the room, and uh, in the afternoon they came in. I walked in the room, and and you know all the all these strange people. Walter Yetnikoff was there. Uh, promotion people. All kind of folks, but what I left the room with the impression of, and I went on to talk to several other record labels after that, after that particular time after that I met them. What the, the what I left the room with, the impression I left the room with, is this one guy, this guy named Ronald Luxemburg, who had talked to me and told me that we can do great things together. Come and come, come with my record label. I believe I, I like what you do. I believe in what you do, and we can do great things together. We can we can we can make things pop, and that was what convinced me about uh, about going with with the Epic label was Ron. It was his enthusiasm. It was his just his whole demeanor. He just had this aura of uh, I can make things happen for you. You know, I was pretty young at the time, uh, and and it was like, I can I can make things happen for you. I can I can get things going for you. I know what you're doing. I know how to market it. I know how to get you. You know, how, how you, we could take you on, to another whole level that you have never been to, and you know, so come sign with my record label. And that's basically the reason, more so than any other contributing factor, uh, the size of the record label or or anything about it. I signed with them because of Ronald Luxemburg. He was he was my motivating factor for me signing with CBS with Epic at that time. You know, you mentioned marketing, from and not to get into a whole big conversation about marketing, but early on, did they have a hard time pinpointing exactly what you were doing? Uh, country, country rock, southern rock. I don't think all the labels were quite there yet, right? I mean, the industry in large did. We we. We would have songs that uh, you know would play. Uh, we've always been kind of across the board. So, uh, some of our our stuff would play on country stations and on rock stations and on all different kinds of stations. Nobody knew exactly what we were, and uh, we were, as I say, all across the board. And I think you know trying to trying to put a name on what we were doing. Uh, was difficult because they didn't know where to call us rock or country or, or what. And we did, the truth of the matter was, we did some of all of it. But the thing was, and what the deal was with Ron and what made it so wonderful to me was he told me, I had a firm six album deal. That is unheard of these days. Wow. I had a firm deal for six albums, and he told me, if you don't do it the first album, you'll do it the second one. If you don't do it the second one, you'll do it the third one. In other words, I'm signing you because of the talent that I, that you have. I believe in what you can do. I believe in, you know, in what you will do, and I will stay with you until you get it done. And that was a commitment. That was uh, that was what made it so wonderful to me. Was here is a man who is the head of a record label who really believes 
in what we're doing, and he can deliver for us, and he did. And, you know, that was that was my thing. You know, a lot of times people are fooled by the size of a, of a company, whether it's a management firm or a record company or a booking agency or whatever. A lot of times they'll be fooled by it because they think because of its size, because of the numbers, uh, the size of the company that it can that it's going to do them a lot of good by just virtue of being with that company. But the truth of the matter is that a, a company is only made up by people, and if you don't have people who believe in you, if if nobody if you're just signing because of the size of the place and you don't have a friend there, if you don't have somebody who really believes in you, you're spinning your wheels. It doesn't really. It, it, you're actually better off somewhere else. But we had that there. We had a friend. We had a, a man who believed in us, who kept us our product noticed all the time uh, the people that were, were working it, the promotion people, the people who were uh, selling it, the merchandise people. He kept us in front of them all the time. That's what it takes. You can, you can easily be an also-ran if you just sign with a record company because, well, this is the biggest record company in the world. They're going to do good for me. Not if you don't have somebody who's in your corner and is pushing for you. And that's what we had. And that's what I felt in Ron and the reason I signed with the record label. How about some of the early touring, maybe prior to Epic, uh, maybe even prior to Kama Sutra? Uh, do you remember your first uh, your first tour? Say again? Your first tour, your first uh, uh, tour performing around the country. Oh, the first tour? Yeah. We had been touring. I, I had been, you know, uh, gosh, I'd been touring hard for before we ever got a, a major you know, major record deal. Uh, I have been making my living since 1958 in the music business, and everything I've done, you know, I've been uh, is uh, it's been music related, with the exception of I think five weeks I worked for a junkyard in Denver many years ago. But I had been, you know, if I was not touring around promoting a record or didn't have a record to promote, I would be, you know, working in clubs. So that was my way of making a living. I was a seasoned performer before I ever had a major maker, major record deal. So the stage was nothing new to me. I, uh, it was, of course, I learned a lot. The sizes of the venues we started playing, we started opening for the other groups. Uh, the size of the crowd we played for were different, but I was very much in tune with performing live, so it was not a new thing to me at all. Yep. That being said, the first big band that you toured, and when I say big, I mean uh, you, the first supporting tour that you had done. Can, can you speak up just a little bit? I can hardly hear you. Oh, I'm sorry. You know what? You were a little away there from you go. that. Here okay, we go. Now, you ask your question again, if you will. Yeah, I'm sorry. The uh, the first tour that you could remember uh, that you supported a major artist or an artist that had a bigger following than you. We toured a lot with some of the Southern bands. We did. We toured a, more than any band we have ever worked with. We worked with the Marshall Tucker Band. Oh. And uh, when they had... W they, their first album was a hit. Leonard Skinner's first album was a hit. Uh, we opened for for them. We opened. We t we traveled with the Marshall Tucker Band. I, I don't I don't even not know how long our tours used to last, but on and on and on and on and on, night after night after night, we toured with them, and they put us in front of a lot of people, and uh, you know made it possible for us to play our music for the masses and and find some acceptance there. But we. Gosh, we toured with Tucker just week after week after week. And like I say, we played with the Leonard Skinner Band. We'd open once in a while for the, for the Allman Brothers Band. Uh, we played with everybody from Willie Nelson to the Rolling Stones. We did a tour with Eric Clapton pretty early on. Uh, we were Once we started finding some recognition, we were pretty much in demand for an opening act uh, before in that kind of twilight zone between the time that you're that you are actually meaningless on the marquee to where you start meaning something on the marquee, but not enough to headline. Uh, but you can help sell tickets with a, a, another act that's bigger than you are. So we did quite a bit of that. We There was several years. And then you start, of course, you start headlining smaller places. But 
we were touring very heavily back. Uh, we have always been a very heavily touring band, and, and we were touring be- very heavily back starting in the, gosh, the middle 70s uh, on up to the present day. Leonard Skinner, when the horrible tragedy and the news of the horrible tragedy came, do you remember where you were? I remember exactly where I was. I remember the exact circumstances. I was playing Keel Auditorium or Keel Theater in uh, St. Louis, Missouri, and we had gone in uh, to, you know, get ready to go to do the show, and somebody walked in my dressing room and told me that there had been a plane crash. I didn't believe it. I thought it was just a, a, a rumor, and I went downstairs. I had a friend that uh, was a program director for a radio station there, a guy named Shelly Grafman. He used to program KC. And I said, Shelly, I just heard a horrible rumor. Can you check it out for me and let me know? And he left uh, to check it out, and I never saw him again that night. I guess he went around the station, and they started broadcasting. But uh, I found out about probably 30 seconds before I walked on stage that there had been oh a plane crash, that there had been fatalities, that, uh, but they were not releasing the fatalities, the names of the fatalities before they could let the families know. So I knew one on stage, knowing that I had had some friends who had been killed, but I did not know who the, who it was, which friends had been killed. And I never found out until about 2 o'clock in the morning. But uh, it was a strange night. It was a strange night going on stage, knowing you had lost some friends, but you didn't know who it was. So we kind of took it out on the music. We played and played and played, and we never said anything to the people about it. But uh, it was a pretty strange night. Oh, my gosh. And these are people that you, you know, you become like family with them when you tour oh, with yeah. them. The Marshall Tucker Band, are you still in touch with the folks from them? Yeah, oh, yeah. Well, there's only one original member left on the road now, Doug Gray, the singer. And, of course, uh, the Caldwell brothers have both passed away, oh, Toy and Tommy. That's true. Uh, and, but Doug still has a band. He still has a name, and he still tours, and they're still a very good band. And we do work together once in a while. We don't work together as much as we did in the early days. But, yeah, we still get together once in a while. Turning Point with Frank McKay returns right after this. Welcome back to Turning Point with Frank McKay. The the movement in the 70s towards Southern Rock, and uh, Leonard Skinner had a tremendous amount to do with it. And you, you know, I, I think you probably had the biggest hit out of them all with uh, Devil Went Down to Georgia. And uh, how long did that that stay on number one? I mean, that was up there for a while. You know, I don't know. It was number one on the country charts, and it was top, you know, on all the charts, basically all the charts that uh, that followed, you know, pop type music. Uh, it's that song is amazing. I mean, it's uh, it kind of transcends the generations and the. It, Little kids like it, older people like it, so it's it kind of, even though it's not on the charts, it kind of stays around, you know, it kind of, it, it kind that song is uh, used in commercials and, you know, played on the radio quite a bit and everything, so it's still our signature song, but uh, I don't know how long it stayed on the charts, but the album was stayed on the charts, the album is multi-platinum, I don't even know what the sales are up to now, but it's it's in the millions. So it's it's been a very very good song for us. It's it's really a short story if you look at it that way. It's a, it's a story. It's a it's a legend. It's a southern legend. And well, a I, lot of my songs manifest themselves in being stories. Legend of Woody Swamp and Trudy and I mean just I, my mind operated that way and still does to some extent. For some odd reason, it's, it's like I I've, I've always I've always liked a really good storyteller. And uh, when I would get ready to write a song, a lot of times I would think in terms of, of telling a story, you know, with a, a beginning, a middle, and an end. So quite a few of my songs are that way. Who influenced you more in your writing than anyone else? A guy named Bob Johnston, who was uh, I met in 1959 in Fort Worth, Texas. On my first trip to the West Coast, I met him. He was... He was working at uh, Bell Helicopter out there, and he was doing some record production and just trying to make it in the music business. And he since uh, then uh, has become a legendary producer. Bob Dylan, Leonard Cohen, Marty Robbins, Johnny Cash, 
Simon and Garfunkel. But at the time I met him, he was writing, uh, you know, writing and trying to produce. And I started writing with him back in the '60s, and uh, we. He he was very demanding. He was very. He was a perfectionist. He wanted. He, he instilled in me, stay with it, stay with the song until you find the right rhyming scheme, the right meter, the right. Be sure you get everything right. Don't be afraid to work on it. Don't give up on it until you get it to where it needs to be. And he was a, a whip cracker. And when I would write with him, we would go into these long sessions of writing, and we would labor over a line, over a word, over a rhyme, over anything that was out of place until we got it as close to what we could consider to be perfect as we could. And, you know, that was just that particular experience with him, I think, did more to improve the caliber of my songwriting than any other any other experience that I can come up with. How has your methodology changed? Uh, methodology changed over the years of writing songs. Uh, has it much? I don't know that it has. I've always been uh, when I if I get an, I keep ideas for songs in my head all the time. I mean, I've constantly got a head full of of, of stuff that are to one degree or another finished. I write a lot in bed at night when I wake up, at, when I, before I go to sleep at night, when I wake up, before I will get out of bed in the morning. If I have a bits and pieces of music in my head and I need to write lyrics, I'll lay there and run lines through my mind. Uh, that's something I've done for many years. But if I come up with an idea for a song, I like to, I may end up writing a totally different song. I had an idea for a song I started in El Paso, Texas, that I was gonna call Pancho Villa. Hmm. And uh, I kept the idea in my mind for 14 years, and I never could finish the song. And finally, I was doing an album with the band, and I came up with the idea for Billy the Kid. So I turned the whole song around and made Billy the Kid song out of it instead of a Pancho Villa song. So you never throw a good idea away. You just keep it and let it kind of let it lead where it will, and eventually you can make something out of it. Do you improv much? Very much so. Oh, yeah. Good gosh, yeah. And what, what do you what do you prefer? Uh, do, do you improv vocally or do you improv on the fiddle um, more and more instrumentally than vocally uh i don't have the the pipes to do you know the i can't do like willie does and you know mm -hmm. move my voice around in all the different areas that he does and all i have to kind of pretty much stay with uh, just try to put feel into it and kind of stay with the melody when i sing but my instruments my whole band is set up that way so that's why it's so much fun to play in cdb is because our music is such that you don't ever have to play the same solo twice if you don't want to. You have to stick with the arrangements. Uh, if there's, you know, guitar harmonies or something going on, you got to stay with that. But once you get into your part, your solo, uh, you play it however you want to. If you want to do it different tonight than you did last night or different tomorrow night than you did tonight, you know, that's fine. I don't care. That's what I want. I encourage creativity. I want my guys to, to, to put their personality into the music. That's what makes a band. That's what makes a band different than a lot of than studio musicians or, or somebody that sits down and reads music every night. They read somebody else's arrangements. That's what makes a band unique is everybody putting their, all six of us putting our personality into it. And, yeah, we, uh, you know, you, we improv a lot. We jam a lot, we call it. In your life, or if you prefer, in your career, what was your turning point? Oh, gosh, I... I would have to say I, my turning point would look like a crossword puzzle, actually, if you looked at it, because I've had several. But one of the big things that happened to me is when I moved to Nashville in 1967 at the behest of Bob Johnston, my writing buddy, who had taken over Columbia Records here. And uh, he said, why don't you come to town so you didn't get something going? And, and I did. And got introduced to uh, another side, the creative side of, of the business rather than just the performance side. Uh, I played on a lot of sessions. I did albums with Bob Dylan. Uh, I was exposed to another side of the bit, the country side of the business also. I did stuff with Leonard Cohen, with Marty Robbins as a studio musician and learned a lot about playing in the studio. I had recorded before, but not to the extent that I did after I came to Nashville. 
learned a lot about recording, learned a lot about uh, how you put a record together, about uh, how the techniques, the basically technical part of recording. But I am not, that is not my forte. My forte is on stage. And uh, I found that out. And when I came to town, it's like I am not the consummate studio musician. I don't do this as well as a lot of other people do. My best thing is entertaining people. That's what I'm good at. That's what I love. So I'm better off doing that. But the turning point in moving to Nashville was I got presented with opportunities that I would never have been presented with if I had just stayed out on the road and played clubs. It was I was here where it was all happening. There were opportunities that came along to to be a part of uh, the Bob Dylan thing came along just off the cuff, basically, and I ended up doing three albums with him. So it, it's there were opportunities in Music City that were not out there in other places. So it made a lot of difference in my in my my life when I came to Nashville. What do you do from here? I mean, you've you've seemed to have done it all. You've had hits. You've traveled. You've written so many great songs and albums. You've had such a wonderful, fantastic career. I mean, is there something left in your bucket list, or if you have a bucket list, is there anything left that, that you really would like to do? There is always something left. There's always another song to write. There's always another show to play. There's always another Grand Ole Opry performance, or, uh, you know, you may end up doing scoring something for a movie, or that. there's just, that's the wonderful thing about the music business. You know, it's not so physically demanding that you can't do it when you're in your 70s like I am. Uh, it's, of course, I don't move around as fast as I used to and jump as high, but still in all, that creative thing is there. It doesn't go away. And there's always new things. I just finished a kid's project, not something for us, but something that uh, I want to be done in cartoon fashion. And, and it's like a kind of a mini musical. Uh, I want to, uh, I want a friend of mine and myself are writing a symphony. I'm writing a biography. Uh, I do two columns a week for our website. I write a lot. I write a lot of things. I write, uh, I'm writing all kinds of stuff. I mean, you know, prosaic stuff and poetic stuff and songs. And, you know, there's no end to it. I can get up. I hadn't been bored, and I could not tell you the last time I've ever been bored. I've always got something to do. I've always got something meaningful to do, something creative I can do. So I don't have a problem finding things to do. Uh, I will do this as long as it's the good Lord's will and as long as people want to hear me do it. And as long, you know, as, long as I have the help to do it, I'll be out here doing it. You mentioned uh, cartoon form. I was watching with my kids. I was watching King of the Hill, and I saw you in cartoon form. I don't know if it was you or they just used your image for it. Did you do that show? Well, it was my voice, yeah. It was, I, yeah. I was in... Uh, gosh, I think I was in Portland, Oregon, and they were in L.A., and I, they had a line hooked up from a recording studio, and I did, is that, is <laughs> I that the, did the lines. Technology is something else nowadays, isn't it? <laughs> is that the first time you saw yourself in cartoon form? Uh, well, in the, yeah, in an a actually cartoon character, yeah. I had seen, you know, renderings of, you know, some very unflattering things. <laughs> <laughs> People had done, but, yeah, that was the first time it was actually a character. Charlie, you're a wonderful guest. We've been here with the great Charlie Daniels. And, Charlie, thank you very much for your time. You're very gracious. It's my pleasure. and enjoy talking to you. Let's do it again sometime. Thank you very much, Charlie. Thank you. Friend. God bless. Bye-bye. Our guest today, our very special guest, has been Charlie Daniels. We'll be back with you next week on Turning Point. Turning Point with Frank McKay was produced by Out of the Box Studios in Bohemia, New York. Executive Producers, Frank McKay, Harry Oates, and Bart Pellegrino. Director of Operations, Corey Arnold. Segment Producer and Talent Coordinator, Kristen McKay. Audio and Studio Engineers, Francis Kazmarek and Tom Shazam. Studio Support, Mark Harwood, Pete Galgano, Brian Hunt, Danielle Altabrando, Keith Withers, and Chris Lulu. Sound Mixing and Mastering, Daniel Joseph. Hotel Accommodations provided by Ohika Castle, Hotel and Estate in Huntington, New York. Transportation Services provided Provided by Mark of Elegance Limousine in Hop New York. Catering services provided by Windows on the Lake in Ronkonkoma, New York.